you know, we started in 2018 uh, with our first target that was set. And this was an emissions intensity target, which was trying to measure and adjust where our emissions were based on the amount of sales that we had. And at the time, the emission target was set at, I believe, 20% over a 10-year time frame. And so you know, we went after those, those emissions reductions in scope one and two, took a number of different actions. Uh, in our facilities, we formed an energy sourcing committee. Olivia is going to walk through uh, all the different things that we did. But the reality was is that we blew past that 20% target um, fairly quickly. We're five years into it, and we've already achieved a 42% reduction in that energy intensity. And we'll talk a little bit more on the next slide on how that achievement was going or was achieved or how that reduction was achieved. But part of it's because the amount of energy that we're using in the facilities has gone down and our usage of renewable energy uh, has gone up. And so that has driven a significant improvement in our overall scope one and two emissions. I'm going to turn it over to Olivia and let her talk a little bit about how we got there. So I can't take credit for actually doing any of this work. There's a lot of employees who have gotten involved in the process. Um, but as mentioned throughout the presentation and in the very beginning through Save Energy, uh, over 50% of the progress we've achieved so far has been through conducting what we call energy treasure hunts. Uh, we didn't invent the idea of an energy treasure hunt. It's a process that the uh, Energy, Star, Energy Star program uh, developed by the US EPA and Department of Energy have developed themselves. But essentially what we do is, you know, we, we go to a facility early on a Sunday morning, shut down operations, and un have a baseline understanding of where energy is still leaking out um, and what tweaks we can make to reduce that. So to date, we've conducted over 50 energy treasure hunts. And on average, for each of those treasure hunts, we find energy savings of 10 to 15%. Uh, and some of the switches we've made to achieve 53% of the progress uh, we've made so far, uh, some of it has come through HVAC setbacks, reducing uh, the footprint of our facilities, uh, in some cases, LED lighting. So, you know, I think the scalability of this is really impressive, and it's been a really great story to share um, and also bring other green teams along with it. Uh, I mentioned before, you know, facility managers get involved in the process. A couple of folks from the sustainability team come along, um, but it's very much driven at the local level. Uh, on the other hand, some of it also comes from grids decarbonizing over time. So through many public and private partnerships, um, the local grids from where we draw electricity, they are decarbonizing and they are coming from more and more renewable energy makes up part of where, where the energy is flowing from. So we are able to consider that as part of our decarbonization efforts. But we've also done our part to purchase renewable electricity on our own. So on the right-hand side, we've featured two of our projects here. One is in Dubai and one is in Brazil. Um, for both of these on-site installations of solar, they're making up more than 50% of the electricity consumption on-site. Perfect. So reminding again about the targets that we've set, we have a 2030 target for scope one and two uh, to get to net zero. And, and again, d there's no magic wands here. It's a lot of just hard work at each of our facilities. It's driving the energy efficiency. We'll continue to work that, continue to look for you know, low carbon electricity generation, where there's good ROIs to make that, uh, that, make that investment. You think about things like electrification. The Copeland business is a great example of how, you know, rather than having furnaces, heat pumps really are a lot more energy efficient and reduce the carbon footprint. So trying to implement more of those types of solutions. And where we can, shifting to lower cost uh, carbon fuels, whether manufacturing or transportation. And ultimately, there's going to probably be some neutralization that has to go into the process. Scope three uh, is in the next category, and that's a much bigger, a much larger percentage of Emerson's overall carbon footprint. And, and reaching those are going to be uh, fairly challenging, but it's going to pull some of the same levers that we talked about before, plus 
It's going to be new product designs, designs that in, by their own development are going to be lower energy intensive. Um, we're going to have to work with suppliers on their operations. We're going to have to purchase materials that have a lower carbon footprint, so more recyclable material. Uh, and then obviously the grids that our suppliers operate on are all moving towards uh, being greener uh, over the time period. I don't know if we covered this or if it was covered in a previous presentation today, but I think it's a good idea to sort of show you the, how scope one and two and three fit. And I'll, with that, I'll turn it over to Olivia. Uh, just, just curious, by a show of hands, uh, how many of the folks here understand the difference between scope one, two, and three? Okay, that's pretty good. Um, I think we've, we've learned that in supply chain, it's always helpful to kind of just start with this basic understanding of, of emissions accounting because everyone's coming at it from a different place. Um, so to start from basics, uh, scope one and two tend to occur, not tend to occur, they occur within uh, your own four walls. So for scope one, that's related to any fuel that is actually being burned on site and emissions are actually coming out into the air. So that could be a, a from a diesel forklift, it could be from refrigerants escaping or any you know, transportation that's happening within your, uh, on your premise. For scope two, uh, for the most part, it's related to electricity, um, but it's essentially any energy that's consumed on site, but then the emissions are happening off site somewhere else. So that's typically a utility provider. Um, and for Emerson, it's for the most part electricity, but it could also cover heat, steam, or cooling. For scope through the, scope three, uh, that essentially covers everything else up and down the value chain. So for Emerson, uh, if you happen to have looked through our ESG report, you might know that most of our emissions um, are in category 11, use of sold product. Uh, a lot of that is attributed to the fact that our products, they last a very long time. So the emissions accounted for in category 11 are meant to cover the entire life, uh, lifetime of the product. Um, on the other hand, what Fred and I really care about, well, not that we don't care about category 11, but what we're focused on driving down is categories one, two, and four. So those are the ones that fall within supply chain. Uh, and even though they, with respect to category 11, they might seem smaller, with respect to our own operational emissions, they are several times larger than what we control within our own four walls. So it's a large number to drive down still. So for categories one and two, that covers our purchase goods and services and also capital goods. Uh, in Emerson terms, we think of that as our direct materials and our indirect materials. So it could be the actual products that we bring into our factories and ultimately assemble, maybe we paint them, but ultimately it's everything we're buying and it's physically coming into our doors. Uh, it also covers the services part. It could cover legal services, um, and then for capital goods, it also covers any equipment we're using to actually work on the product before it ends up in our customers' hands. Uh, and then for upstream transportation and distribution, uh, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. It's logistics. Um, the distinction between upstream transportation and downstream is upstream is when we pay for it. So typically that's from the supplier's door to, to ours. Uh, so we're also sharing a, a breakdown of how our emissions are split across the different commodities that we purchase, and we're a really complicated organization. I'm, I'm very new here, and maybe I've got like a couple products. I have some idea of what they are, um, but from the supply chain perspective, I know it's a lot of different parts. Um, I mean, as far as where the emissions hotspots are, you can see castings, that stands out, steel, but, you know, the electronics parts, machine parts, it's kind of evenly split there, and then you have at least 25% coming from this huge bucket of others, uh, which I think, you know, gives you an idea of how complex the supply chain is that we're dealing with. Uh, and if every supplier is kind of working on producing a different part, the kind of levers that they have to decarbonize are also slightly different. So we have this challenge of, you know, what can we share with all of them that's still applicable? Uh, on the transportation side, I think it's really obvious a lot of the emissions are, are coming from air. And what's really uh, awesome about that 
not, not that the emissions coming from air is awesome, but the nice thing is that, uh, you know, while in many cases we're asking our suppliers to decarbonize, for transportation we actually have alternatives to choose from. So that's really uh, optimistic for our kind of near term, what can we do now to reduce scope three emissions? Can we switch to ocean? Yeah, I think if you think about um, the levers that we have as Emerson, logistics is a great example where 80% of our supply base is regionalized within the world area that we manufacture the products and sell to our customers. And so we purposely designed the supply chain that way to be more responsive, obviously to, ha to be more cost efficient, but it also uh, reduces our, uh, the length of haul that we have to deal with. And so those kinds of levers gives us an opportunity to continue to work this air. And even if the airline industry does not progress rapidly, just moving to ocean will cut the emissions by a factor of 10. So it gives us, there's a lot of levers there and behaviors that we can employ to get to where we need to get to. 